Welcome to the Demography and Aging Seminar. Use the microphone. Okay. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Welcome again to the Demography and Aging Seminar. I'm pleased that we're having Wynn Fan, who's a, a colleague and co-author and collaborator with me here. And to introduce her is the amazing Jesse Himmelstern, who is um, uh, studies, uh, looks at work, family, occupations and disparities and all of the above, and uh, is a population, what are you, a uh, trainee? Population trainee, yeah. Okay, good. Thank you, Jesse. Um, just go assume everyone can hear me. Uh, Dr. Wayne Fenn is an assistant professor of sociology at Boston College. Uh, she received her PhD in 2007 from Department of Sociology here at the University of Minnesota. 2015? Yes. Uh, much of uh, her work examined social determinants of health related outcomes, with particular attention paid to how these outcomes vary across socioeconomic status, historical moments, and organizations, as well as institutional context. Welcome. Oh, we got this wonderful mug. Yes. <laughs> I know you've been waiting for, you know, seven years to get it, but finally. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, let me just give it all, okay. if that's okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, so thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Jesse and Phyllis for this uh, introduction. It was um, great and uh, very, very kind. And I'm very uh, excited to be here and to share on um, this research with you um, today, um, either in person or virtually. So um, I was thinking about the talk um, the other day because uh, the last time I was giving a presentation at the University of um, Minnesota, I was trying to get my PhD degree. Um, so um, today I will try my best to convince and to reassure you that it was not a mistake um, to give me on that degree. <laughs> so um, the project I'm going to um, present uh, for today is um, to examine remote work in the time of COVID-19. And this is a joint um, collaboration uh, with um, Phyllis. Um, and before anything, we would like to just um, acknowledge the critical support um, provided by the National Science Foundation that has made this uh, research project um, possible. So the major aim of this study was uh, to use COVID-19 as a natural experiment to begin to understand uh, how um, the move to remote work affected people's working conditions, their family and personal lives, as well as um, their subjective well-being and uh, physical health outcomes. And uh, today I'm going to focus on the subjective well-being aspect, but I'm happy to discuss uh, other outcomes or other dimensions of uh, remote work if there is such an interest uh, in the Q&A. Um, also, given the theme of this seminar, I will uh, focus on how the, very, how the uh, findings uh, differ um, over the life course. So uh, one of the central and the most important questions in the social sciences is how the social organization of work affects people's um, subjective well-being and therefore produce and reproduce um, social disparities in human wel welfare. Historical uh, evidence abounds on the material and well-being implications of events such as um, the Industrial Revolution and with it um, increases in bureaucratization and routinization. And today, uh, in what some scholars refer to as the second machine age, we are again uh, witnessing upheavals in the social organization and of work, uh, transforming where, when, and how work is done. So even well before the COVID-19 pandemic, we already seen um, trends of automation, um, digitalization, and uh, uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, with the advancement of information and communication technologies, for the very first time in human history, um, a large proportion of workers and knowledge workers in particular, and this includes everyone sitting here in this room and those who are watching this uh, via Zoom, uh, all we need uh, when it comes to work is no more than a laptop connected to the internet. So uh, these constitute the large context in which the uh, move to um, the COVID-19 pandemic really um, shifted or precipitated 
the uh, sudden spike in uh, remote work. Um, despite long being uh, touted as the future of work, when we look at the share of workers who actually worked from home before the pandemic, we uh, didn't really have many uh, workers and even fewer uh, were fully uh, remote. Um, as you can see from this slide, uh, when we look at the trend uh, since the 1990s, uh, even using the most liberal definition of uh, remote work, we wouldn't have more than on uh, 20% and most often just on uh, 15 or 12% of workers who would be classified as remote workers. Compare this on uh, with what happened during um, COVID-19, um, according to some estimates, as high as 60% uh, of workers spent at least some time on uh, working remotely. So uh, this really represents a large scale um, social experiment, um, an exogenous shock that uh, affects basically uh, every aspect of um, people's lives and a shock that is still ongoing and uh, uh, evolving over time. So uh, this then um, makes it extremely important to uh, collect some data to begin to understand um, the uh, life experiences of this large scale um, social shock. Um, it's important also because uh, in the media, we see a lot of framing that on um, the opening up of remote work possibilities as a potential silver lining of the um, pandemic, right? Despite the fact that uh, many workers um, were already are forced to go back to the office as early as uh, April, 2020, and the trend uh, really um, persisted um, since then. But there is also a larger question or a deeper question that whether there is a silver lining uh, to begin with. And the reason I'm saying this is because when we look at um, pre-pandemic uh, research on uh, remote work, we really uh, found some, uh, really it, it was a, a, a mixed picture, right? So we had both positive evidence and uh, negative evidence um, as to how remote work was related to people's uh, well-being. So we don't really have much uh, conclusive um, findings to general, generalize on those pre-pandemic patterns to, um, to a pandemic. That being said, I do want to uh, mention two high quality um, field experiments conducted before the pandemic that gave us some optimism or gave us some um, positive evidence that perhaps remote work would um, pre uh, improve people's um, well being. So, uh, one such um, field experiment was conducted as part of the uh, Work on Family and Health uh, Research Network, uh, led by um, Phyllis, uh, Aaron, and some other uh, scholars in different fields and uh, from different universities. Um, but the key um, component of this uh, study project was really um, to look at, to evaluate the effect of a intervention called uh, STAR, right? So it was an organizational intervention designed to promote um, greater uh, employee control over work time and workplace, as well as um, greater supervisor support um, for workers on personal lives. So as you can see, it's not just a remote work um, pro uh, intervention. It's much bigger um, than that on um, trying to change the whole organizational culture. Um, but a key component of this uh, intervention was about uh, where you work. And many workers uh, did use on this intervention to begin to uh, work from home. And what uh, um, a central finding is that over um, 12 months, uh, STAR reduced um, burnout, um, uh, also reduced um, perceived stress and the psychological distress. It also uh, increased on um, job satisfaction. So overall, uh, just um, improved well-being uh, across the board. Uh, so some of these findings and other um, qualitative um, quotes um, you can find in this uh, award-winning book by uh, Aaron Phyllis uh, Overload. So that is our first um, uh, high quality uh, evidence we have. Another um, piece of evidence we have uh, is uh, done, was a study done by many um, economists and they evaluated this uh, work from home experiment in a Chinese um, travel agency called uh, Ctrip. So it's very similar to uh, Expedia in the United States. And uh, um, they had this large um, call center and uh, they decided to um, randomize half of the call center workers to work from home and the other uh, to work from the office for uh, nine months. And what they found was that uh, home working led to a 13% performance increase. It also, uh, home workers also reported uh, improved work satisfaction, their attrition rate halved uh, even though their promotion rate um, seem to um, fall on uh, conditional um, performance. So it's more or less uh, uh, mixed, but if we just focus on um, well-being well outcomes, um, they again indicate that uh, remote work could lead to an uh, improvement in well-being. 
Uh, but there are two uh, things about this study that I just wanted to uh, mention a little bit. First is that this started with a um, sample of workers who volunteered on to work from home. So in other words, if you know from the very beginning that uh, you would not benefit from remote work or just uh, you, you don't want to work from home, then you wouldn't be um, part of the sample. So this indicates that um, the estimate is likely to be an uh, overestimate the true on effect. But another thing that I found very interesting is that uh, one later uh, after the experiment, uh, C-Trip decided to uh, roll out the option to uh, every um, worker and allowed the um, treatment on employees to reselect between the home and office. They found it very um, interestingly that over half of them um, switched. So indicating a potential learning effect that after you actually experience the remote work, you might gain some new insights about whether this is really something you want to do. So a similar um, situation might also emerge um, during the pandemic when, according to our estimates, uh, about 40% of workers uh, they, uh, really didn't have any um, remote work experience before on the pandemic. So these findings are very helpful, um, but uh, I also want to mention that uh, we also have some questions regarding whether we can just easily apply those pre-pandemic evidence to a pandemic setting, given that so many other things are changing at the same time. And I just want to mention a few things that might um, complicate the um, generalizability of um, pre-pandemic uh, evidence. First is um, the question of uh, selection, because when we look at um, before 2020, what kind of workers that were able to work from home, it was mostly um, high SES or those advantaged workers who uh, typically heavily concentrated in certain industries, uh, IT technology in particular. But uh, now, um, especially in the very beginning of the pandemic, given uh, lockdown and given the um, stay at home order, many workers, um, uh, many uh, a more diverse um, set of uh, workers in different occupations, in different industries are now uh, working from home. And some of these occupations might not be that well suited to be done at home. So this might affect um, the extent to which they could benefit from uh, remote work. Uh, relatedly, we also have this question about whether remote work was considered to be valued on flexibility or imposed constraints. So uh, this was uh, similar to the first point, but the idea is that uh, given that, um, so before the pandemic, uh, workers um, did have some choice over where um, they work and many uh, remote workers, they did so um, because they wanted to do so, uh, which is no longer the case during uh, the pandemic when a remote work might be uh, perceived by some as um, like a constraint that you have to do it because of um, government policies or because of organizational uh, policies. So this might also change how they uh, interpret remote work and how they benefit um, by remote work. And uh, um, the shift to remote work um, is also not a smooth process and it might be accomplished by um, deterioration in working conditions. Uh, we see some uh, reports, for example, on the monitoring and the surveillance on uh, technologies being used by many uh, firms, such as on this one, where employees um, were asked to um, uh, be uh, photographed every five minutes by an always on, on video just to ensure they are actually working. Right? And this coupled with the fact that at least in 2021, uh, many workers had uh, massive anxiety over uh, economic downturn, over um, generalized um, precarity they might feel that they have this need to prove their uh, value to um, the firm. So they might, uh, in fact, begin to work 24 seven, respond to emails uh, instantaneously and uh, work every time, uh, every, um, any, anywhere. So um, if that's the case, that remote work might actually be leading to more burnout and more stress rather than as a way to combine work and family uh, responsibilities as it uh, was typically portrayed on before on the pandemic. And of course, uh, let's not forget that uh, the move to uh, remote work also coincided with the move to online schooling. When um, for many uh, workers, uh, parents and uh, uh, mothers in particular, they are performing three uh, equally demanding jobs as a worker, as a um, parent, and also as a um, teacher. So, um, so all of these um, could somehow limit the extent to which uh, workers really um, benefit from uh, a remote work. So it's also uh, important to begin to uh, collect data to understand what is really uh, happening for the well-being of those uh, remote workers. 
So that's uh, the first question we want to answer, which is how the changing working conditions as induced by the move to remote work during the pandemic affect people's um, subjective well-being. And we are looking at the two um, fundamental aspects of working conditions, the spatial and the um, temporal aspect. First is that uh, while many uh, workers, they move to remote work, uh, some experienced increase, some experienced decrease uh, in hours and others uh, work hours might uh, remain unstable. And later on when uh, some workers uh, were, uh, went back to the office, either voluntarily or involuntarily, um, they have this um, change in workplaces. So how uh, this stability or change in work hours or workplaces affect people's um, subject to well-being? That's um, the first um, question we wanted to um, answer. Um, but a second uh, equally important question that we try to answer is that for whom um, is there a uh, civil lining or whether this um, stress or this um, process is evenly experienced across different uh, social groups. So that's the uneven um, stress of social change on um, process we try to uh, evaluate. And we draw on stress process and the life force on uh, theory to, um, to examine this question. So both perspectives emphasize the importance of examining um, human meanings of social change. So instead of just looking at uh, social structures or social arrangements at one given time point, cross-sectionally speaking, we are um, trying to evaluate how changes uh, in social arrangements or matter, how they, um, the, such change could be a source of stress. Um, and accordingly, we examine uh, whether a deliberate shifts in the work environment could affect people's uh, well-being. Um, and both stress process and life course theory also emphasize on um, timing. So on uh, one in individuals biographies, a particular um, social crisis such as on um, COVID-19 happened um, because younger workers, older workers and those in the middle um, uh, life stage, they came to the crisis um, through different life course paths and with different uh, social, cultural and material capital which could all affect how they uh, respond or how they um, perceive um, remote work. In addition to age, we also evaluated or try to examine disparities along other uh, social dimensions, social identities, such as uh, race, ethnicity, uh, social class. Uh, but given the limited time I have um, here, um, I'm not going to um, present those findings, but um, I can talk about those findings uh, in, in the Q&A. Um, so to capture on timing, and also on disparities in other uh, dimensions, we draw on an intersectionality on lands. Uh, so uh, trying to locate people at the crossroads along multiple um, dimensions. In particular, we will evaluate how the um, findings differ by the intersection of gender and life course on stage. Uh, so gender, because we know our work family, uh, these two institutions are heavily um, gendered with um, paid work central to many men's uh, self-identity and uh, uh, women are still expected and typically do uh, engage in a lot of uh, caregiving um, tasks. Um, so this is um, the second question we try to answer, that is how the relationship between changes in working conditions and well-being um, differs depending on the intersection of gender and the life force on stage. So to answer these questions, we have collected some uh, original data, um, both quantitative and qualitative, uh, so we have conducted a nationally uh, representative data using knowledge panel, which is the largest um, probability um, based online panel in the United States. And uh, uh, we, um, the sampling frame consists of those who spend some time working remotely during um, COVID, uh, regardless of their employment status or working arrangements when surveyed. So this means that when at the baseline survey, some of them uh, might have already returned back to the office and some might uh, have lost their jobs, but as long as they spend at least some time working from home, they would be eligible for our um, study. And uh, thus far, we have conducted uh, three uh, waves of data collection uh, beginning in October 2020 and six months later in April 2021 and again on uh, October 2021. And we'll uh, be conducting another wave of data collection in April uh, this year, so in about uh, one month. Uh, and uh, the baseline sample was about 3,000 workers. And uh, wave two and wave three, we had a retention rate of about um, 76%. And um, today's um, uh, findings will be mostly based on the first two uh, wave of um, data. And uh, while at about the same time when we conducted the um, baseline survey, we also 
uh, collected some qualitative um, data, uh, again, using a survey, but a survey uh, mostly consisting of uh, open-ended questions. And on the, uh, we recruited on the sample using uh, um, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Uh, so it's obviously not a representative um, sample, uh, but the goal is really trying to, uh, to get at uh, how people understand the experience or um, perceive on remote work. So to answer those um, uh, how and why on um, questions. And we had about uh, 230 um, workers in this, um, uh, for this um, qualitative survey. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, four different uh, well-being uh, outcomes, burnout, work to family conflict, job satisfaction, and life satisfaction. So uh, work to family conflict, um, this is something that I want to emphasize uh, is that uh, even though we call it a uh, work to family conflict, uh, it also includes interference of job with um, personal life. So it also applies to people who might not have those conventionally unconceived uh, family. Right, so, um, so this is uh, our well-being outcomes and a key measure for our intersectionality analysis is to use a uh, life course stage, which is um, constructed using three different variables, age, uh, whether uh, respondents have a preschool child or school aged child living at home and whether they provide adult care for at least uh, 20 hours during the last um, six months. So accordingly, we have these uh, five uh, groups, five different life stages ordered by their average age here. So the youngest are those younger than 35 with no caregiving obligations. The second group is the one with the uh, most intensive caregiving responsibilities, having a preschooler or sandwiched between uh, childcare and adult care. A uh, third one is uh, middle adults, uh, middle adult women or men who have no caregiving re responsibilities. And uh, the fourth group is also middle adults, uh, but they have either a school aged child or um, caring for adults, but not both. Lastly, we have uh, older workers uh, who do not provide um, child or adult care. Um, and all the uh, analysis in the quantitative, um, for the quantitative models, we have um, control for these um, covariates, which I can uh, discuss uh, in, in a QA. Um, and uh, uh, the quantitative uh, part of this uh, the study, we use our ordered loaded regression models, uh, mostly for simplicity, um, but we also tried uh, multinomial loaded regression models on finding very similar uh, findings. Um, and all the uh, findings I'm going to present are using um, predicted probabilities. So for example, um, for example, the predicted probability of um, uh, how satisfied or very satisfied uh, you are with um, uh, so sorry. Um, so for example, for life satisfaction, we are essentially um, presenting the predicted probability of either satisfied or very satisfied with your life. Um, so this might uh, facilitate understanding and the comparison across different uh, groups. Um, so let's uh, look at the, uh, the first uh, major component of our findings, which is how changes in hours affect people's uh, well-being and how that differs by gender and uh, uh, life course stage. Um, so for this set of analysis, we draw on the baseline um, data. So it's cross-sectional uh, for this um, part. And uh, we uh, removed a few workers who did not have a job before COVID-19 and those who were not uh, employed when surveyed. This is only to make sure that we do not confound the effect of unemployment and the effect of uh, changing work hours. So um, before I talk about the findings for uh, well-being, I think it might make a little um, sense or might be helpful to, uh, to see a few uh, uh, quotes to see uh, why people's uh, work hours changed and how their uh, work hours um, changed compared with um, pre-pandemic. Um, so in terms of the general distribution of changes in work hours, in, ba uh, in baseline survey, we ask people compared with um, before the pandemic, how have your work hours uh, shifted or changed um, when you work from home? So this, uh, just to remember that this, the data was collected in October on 2020. So when compared before on the pandemic, slightly or more than half, 52% said that there was no change uh, whatsoever. And about equal numbers of people uh, either experienced an increase or a reduction in work hours. Uh, with some notable uh, gender differences that uh, women on uh, average are less likely to see stability in their work hours and they are more likely to be found in the two extreme um, categories. So women are more likely than men to either experience a major decrease or a major increase in hours. 
And uh, for the following analysis, I'm going to combine those two decreased and the two increased on um, groups just to make sure that we have enough people in each um, group. So as to uh, why our work hours shifted, how workers account for um, changes or stability in hours, uh, we can um, try to get some um, hint by looking at some um, quotes we get from the qualitative um, survey. So for increased work hours, we found that um, two major um, themes really um, stand out. First is um, due to blurring um, boundaries between work and family. And the second is um, due to um, that they have to work longer in order to make up for time loss due to an interruption. So for example, the first quote um, by Lin, who is a, an IT worker, she said that previously um, there was more solid boundary between start and end of my work day. But now uh, everything is done at home. Uh, my work seems to bleed into everything else. Uh, there is never a time when the work day is over and people understand work related on uh, emails at all hours of the day. Right, so you can see that um, this was especially the case for many um, first time remote workers when suddenly they need to uh, work from home. They found that they are not that used to this uh, new working condition and found this uh, um, blurred boundaries between work and um, family. Also, the expectation also changed on uh, somehow that, uh, so you can see that the people begin to send work on uh, emails even in non-conventional working time. So uh, forcing them to also uh, work uh, even beyond uh, regular work hours. And the second uh, reason is due to uh, interruption. And this is especially the case uh, for many parents. So for instance, uh, this uh, uh, person, uh, Mandy, who is a single mom, uh, she said that my job has never been a high stress job, it's government, but now I be in an online meeting and be interrupted uh, by a kid needing help and it can't wait until the meeting is over. So she feels constantly uh, harassed and uh, um, stressed. So, um, so this, um, right, so to make up for this, to compensate for the time that they lost due to having to care for a child or care for an adult, then they need to work longer uh, to get the job done. For uh, reduced work hours, what we found is mostly a story of uh, reduced uh, market demands that, um, so again, recall that on uh, this uh, data were collected in 2020 when we still had a deep economic um, downturn and a recession even. So um, for instance, uh, Becky, uh, who is a graphic designer said that with the pandemic and so many businesses closed, we lost uh, many uh, clients, right? So she does uh, enjoy working from home, but uh, uh, the complaint is the lack of hours and um, pay. Uh, similarly, um, the second um, person, uh, Lee, who is an Asian man in sales said that we just are not making the same money we did on pre-COVID. So a lot of workers have been laid off. I have to be uh, thankful that I still have my position albeit on reduced hours. And uh, he uh, voiced some very um, intense um, pessimism regarding the, the future uh, sustain sustainability of uh, his um, position. But interestingly, uh, there is also a group, uh, even though a small group of uh, workers whose hours decreased because of increased productivity. So this is typically tends to be on men and uh, uh, higher SES men in particular, such as on uh, this investment director, he said that the lack of strength from uh, commuting and uh, the ability to uh, multitask uh, really has bumped um, productivity up. So uh, he doesn't have to put in as longer hours as um, before. So, uh, so this is also another uh, reason, even though, again, it's a very small group of uh, workers who um, mentioned this. As for uh, those work hours who, uh, whose work hours did not um, change at all, uh, two reasons um, primarily. The largest reason is just that there is simply a lack of change in most aspects of their jobs. Uh, so for instance, uh, this um, uh, scientist, uh, he said that uh, we simply are morphed from the office to the online world. Uh, everything else remained unstable. So there is no reason for him to have to change his uh, hours. But interestingly, um, there is also a group, uh, even though again, it's a small group who um, have maintained their hours uh, in a stable way, mainly because they made this um, deliberate um, decision that they wanted, for example, as this uh, Hispanic man said, that I wanted to keep a sense of normalcy. So uh, in this case, the ability to choose their own hours, uh, this high control over work time really allowed them to exercise control, exercise uh, agency in order to facilitate a uh, future transition back to the uh, office. So uh, with these uh, findings in mind, I think it might be easier to begin to appreciate uh, some of these uh, findings I'm going to report. 
So here, what I'm reporting here is that uh, by gender, so women and men separately, uh, for those whose hours decreased, so the green bar, those whose hours increased, those uh, orange bar, uh, how their well-being compares relative to this uh, reference group, uh, those whose uh, hours remained unstable. So in other words, whether a reduction or an increase in hours leads to better or worse well-being compared with those uh, whose hours uh, did not change. So when we first look at an increase in hours, now we find a very clear evidence that uh, um, if you have to work longer than before, then um, the, they tend to report um, greater burnout, greater work to family conflict, uh, lower job satisfaction and lower life satisfaction. So basically worse well-being across the board. And we do not see um, any gender difference uh, in, this, um, in this regard. For a reduction in work hours, uh, similar findings, except for um, burnout. So with the only exception of burnout, uh, if one's work hours decrease the, rather than remain stable, they also see greater work to family conflict and a lower job and life satisfaction. When we um, combine these um, together, then it seems to be the case that um, burnout and work to family conflict are more susceptible to an increase in hours, whereas um, job satisfaction appears to be more um, uh, susceptible, susceptible to a reduction in work hours. And also we do not find a much gender difference if we just compare women and men. But this does not mean that um, there is no um, gender difference whatsoever because we need to look at certain subgroups of women and certain subgroups of men in order to really see how um, gender plays a role. And that is what we did um, next to look at how results differ at the intersection of gender and the life course on stage. So um, the picture is a little uh, complicated because we now have um, 10 different groups, five for women and five for men um, at a different life course on stage. So uh, let's first uh, look at an increase in hours. So the first thing that really um, stands out is you, you see that for virtually every of these 10 groups, their well-being um, became, uh, seems to be at risk if they need to put in longer hours. Um, every of these um, 10 groups, they see greater burnout, um, greater work to family conflict. And for most gr uh, groups, they see a uh, lower job satisfaction and a lower life satisfaction across the board. So I, I should mention that on um, these uh, uh, stars above or below the bars indicate that these findings are statistically different from um, zero. Um, and uh, so that is a general uh, finding. But another uh, finding is that certain groups are particularly uh, vulnerable in the face of an increase in hours. One such group uh, is women, um, young women without caregiving obligations. They report the greatest burnout and the lowest um, job satisfaction if they need to work longer rather than on um, the same hours as before. Um, another uh, group of women whose well-being suffers is uh, women with intensive caregiving obligations. With a preschooler or in the sandwich generation, they also see on um, greater burnout and the, the lowest on um, life satisfaction when their hours um, increase. So um, the findings that I'm highlighting here are based on um, pairwise um, comparison on tests. So um, these tests are not shown here, but uh, um, that's uh, the basis on which uh, we uh, make those um, conclusions. Um, and uh, this is, uh, so increased hours is not just uh, affecting women, it also affects some men. Uh, in particular, we find that for job satisfaction, uh, men with older kids or who provide adult care, their job satisfaction experience greater reduction uh, or they see on greater or lower on job satisfaction if their uh, hours increase. So that is uh, for uh, increased hours. How about um, when work hours uh, reduce? Uh, now we see that first um, job satisfaction, as I mentioned before, seems to be particularly vulnerable when hours decrease, when you see the magnitude of these uh, uh, bars. But also two groups of men are particularly vulnerable when they need to work fewer hours. And those are the two uh, middle adult men. So men, a middle adult men with, without caregiving obligations, as well as a men with older kids or who provide adult care. So it's likely that uh, these men uh, in, the, in their prime uh, career stage um, perhaps paid work is particularly central to their uh, life, to their uh, self-identity. So unable to uh, work um, the same hour as before might become at particularly uh, high risk for them. 
and um, this uh, woman, this man might also, you know, uh, just uh, feel the potential possibility of a job loss, which might um, affect their ability to provide for the family. So all of these combined might affect, um, might indicate why their uh, well-being suffers. So uh, next, uh, so that is for uh, work hours. And next, uh, let's uh, just uh, uh, look at the second part of this um, uh, study is the how changes in workplaces um, affect people's um, subsequent change in uh, well-being. And uh, for this part of the analysis, we use the panel on um, component um, comparing wave one and wave two. And uh, uh, again, we remove a few uh, workers who were not uh, at work or working um, for most of the time uh, between the two waves to not confound the effect of unemployment. So what we did first is that um, we asked um, people uh, for each month between wave one, October, 2020, and wave two, April, 2021, what best describes your uh, working arrangement. So we give them these options and we um, combine certain categories to create a full um, category measure. So working many at home, working many away from home, uh, a hybrid arrangement. So about equal number of um, time, uh, equal time away from or at home. And then those are who are mostly not, uh, not working. So uh, we then try to uh, use this uh, uh, six or seven months um, working arrangements, try to see, uh, to come up with some pathways that describe um, people's um, transition into or uh, out of uh, remote work. So, and we, 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 what we did uh, was to use uh, sequence analysis, and we found a few uh, these are uh, four uh, clusters that uh, um, best uh, that fit the data on the best. So, the first uh, group of workers we find are those who um, work from home on a continuous basis throughout on this six or uh, seven months, and uh, the second group are those are uh, what we call early returners because they returned even before um, uh, we won in October, 2020. So relatively early into the pandemic. And the third group are those what we call uh, recent returners because uh, they returned at some point before uh, we, uh, we won and uh, between uh, we won and uh, we two. And lastly, we have uh, hybrid workers who are mostly uh, in a hybrid uh, working arrangement uh, throughout uh, this uh, observational window. So uh, these are the four groups uh, we found. And uh, the question is uh, really uh, who benefits more um, from that particular working arrangement, right? So how their uh, well-being uh, shifts or remains unstable. So uh, similar to before, uh, we looked at uh, these um, changes in uh, well-being and uh, we uh, have these uh, four groups. And the idea is to look at, for instance, compare with those who keep uh, a remote work arrangement throughout the, uh, the, the, the observational window, whether an early return, a recent return or hybrid work is associated with greater increases in well-being or greater uh, reductions in well-being. So on um, this, uh, again, this um, black, this baseline uh, represents those whose work hours, uh, that, who's, uh, who are in a uh, remote work uh, arrangement throughout this uh, seven months. And um, all of these predictions are based on a model where we control for left dependent variables. So we are essentially looking at changes here. Uh, when we look at early return, we see some um, uh, mixed findings that uh, on one hand, we see some evidence that their job demands or job stress really increases. So for wo both women and men, if they return to the office early in the pandemic, rather than in a uh, fully remote arrangement, uh, they see greater increase in burnout. And for men only, they see a greater increase in work to family conflict. But on the other hand, we also see some uh, evidence that their job satisfaction also see some uh, improvement, uh, greater improvement um, over time. So it's not uh, uh, as consistent as what we saw um, before um, for work hours. For a recent return, it's mostly a story of work to family on conflict. Uh, we see that for both men and women, um, their work to family conflict increased to a greater extent if they returned between waves rather than um, uh, keep a fully uh, remote uh, arrangement. Lastly, uh, for hybrid arrangement, so about the same um, time um, working from home and working away from home, 
uh, we see some gender differences that uh, for job satisfaction, women's on gender, uh, women's on job satisfaction seem to suffer uh, greatly if they are in a hybrid arrangement, but uh, not so much um, for men. And this um, difference is statistically um, significant. So uh, as useful as uh, these findings are, uh, again, we are just looking at uh, women as a whole and men as a whole. Uh, and some of these findings really unmask the vast uh, heterogeneity across life course on stages. So that's what we did uh, next when examining how the patterns really differ um, by the intersection of gender and uh, life course stage. So again, these are 10 different um, groups. And uh, if we look at um, first uh, early returning, then our first finding we found is that uh, for those who are at both ends of the life course stage, so younger women and men, but also older uh, women and men, their well-being um, uh, suffers the greatest um, if they need to go back to the office early into the pandemic, right? So older women and the younger men, they see the greatest uh, increase in burnout. And uh, younger women and the younger men, they see the greatest increase uh, in work to family conflict um, when they uh, return to the office early as opposed to um, keep uh, working remotely. Another group that, uh, whose well-being suffers is women with um, some um, caregiving obligations. With older kids or um, provide adult care, they also see greater increase in burnout and work-to-family conflict. So, uh, so that is an early return. For a recent return, what we found is that uh, one group really uh, stands out, which is uh, older men. Uh, for older men who do not provide care, um, then if they are uh, returned between week one and week two, they see the greatest increase in burnout, work to family conflict, and the greatest decline in job satisfaction. Uh, and another group of men whose uh, th their well being also suffers, which is um, young men who see a much greater um, increase in work to family conflict. For those uh, with some caregiving obligations, uh, we note some gender differences here. First uh, is that, sorry, let me. So first is that, is that uh, women uh, with older kids or adult care, their well-being uh, takes a, um, uh, is at risk if they are returned between waves. But for men in uh, relatively similar situations, they seem to um, gain some benefits if they returned um, to the office. Right, so for those are men with intensive caregiving obligations, you see that their burnout um, begin to uh, decline the most and their job satisfaction increase the most uh, if they return between waves. So uh, these uh, decreases and increases are not statistically significant in themselves, but uh, when you compare uh, this change with other uh, groups, they do um, the trend uh, we see in other groups, they do um, uh, they are um, significantly different. So indicating that uh, these uh, men with intensive caregiving obligations, they tend to um, benefit more from a recent return um, in terms of well-being. And lastly, for hybrid arrangement, we also find some uh, disparate um, findings. And uh, um, the first thing to note is that, um, again, uh, younger and older women and men at uh, both, um, so those um, people at both ends of the life course stage, their uh, uh, well-being benefits the most from a hybrid arrangement. So uh, younger women, younger men, uh, older women and older men, their uh, well-being, you see some improvement if they are in a hybrid rather than a fully remote arrangement. Um, but uh, for uh, those people who uh, provide care, again, some notable gender differences emerge. For women uh, with um, preschoolers or who are in the sandwich generation, uh, we see some um, complexity here that their burnout and work to family conflict increase uh, to a greater extent if they are in a hybrid arrangement. But at the same time, their job satisfaction also increased uh, somewhat. Uh, so I could talk more about this uh, in the Q&A, but based on the qualitative data, um, some women did say that um, because they are in this hybrid arrangement, they need to constantly think about work and family obligations and the demands which could be uh, stressful. But at the same time, the opportunity to be in this uh, hybrid arrangement allows them to, you know, to use that opportunity to um, balance the work and family uh, responsibilities, which could be a source of uh, job satisfaction. So, uh, so that is for women. But for men uh, in similar situations, 
it's a much um, clearer um, pattern that they really are hate on uh, hybrid um, arrangement because a uh, man with some um, preschoolers or in the sandwich generation see the greatest increase in burnout and the largest um, decline in um, job satisfaction if they, are, if they are in a hybrid arrangement. So uh, given these findings, let me just um, quickly um, summarize uh, what we found uh, for this set of uh, analysis. So what we found is that uh, for women and men at both ends of the life course stage, um, younger women, younger men, older women, and older men who do not um, provide uh, child or adult care, they suffer when they go back to the office as indicated by these um, uh, circles. On the other hand, their well-being improves the most if they are in a hybrid arrangement. So, um, so, so this is uh, for that particular um, group. For those with um, family caregiving obligations, we note some um, gender differences. Women uh, with uh, caregiving obligations tend to um, somehow um, be harmed by uh, returning to an office. For, for men, however, um, they tend to gain more um, benefits, well-being benefits, when they are able to um, go back to the office. On the other hand, these uh, similar, uh, similarly situated men, men with uh, intensive caregiving obligations, their well-being uh, suffers the most if they are in a hybrid arrangement. So that's, uh, that's the um, general uh, findings uh, we see uh, in this, uh, for this set of uh, intersectional analysis. So uh, given the um, time I have left, let me just um, quickly summarize um, the major findings uh, in this, uh, um, in this uh, research and uh, um, provide some brief uh, explanations and then we can uh, have a, a Q&A session. Um, so, so recall that we look at these on two different um, uh, working conditions, work hours and workplaces. For changes in work hours, we find that generally working more uh, is associated with lower well-being, but uh, working less is also associated uh, with lower well-being. So it seems to be the case that uh, in this time where everything was changing so fast, uh, maintaining a sense of stability that you are able to uh, work uh, in regular hours was all the more important in terms of um, promoting our well-being. But some uh, subgroups of men and women are particularly um, disadvantaged by uh, increased or a decrease in hours. So for increased hours, we found that uh, women with preschoolers or in the sandwich generation tend to be uh, harmed, especially more by uh, working longer hours than before. And so are um, uh, young women with no caregiving obligations. But we also find that this is um, the case for certain groups of men, uh, men with uh, older children at home or caring for adults. Their job satisfaction also declines uh, to a great extent uh, when they work longer, have to work longer. Uh, for a reduction in work hours, um, the two groups that are especially disadvantaged are those uh, two middle adult uh, men, regardless of their caregiving obligations. They see um, uh, lower well-being if they have to work on uh, fewer hours. For um, changes in workplaces, um, when we look at returning to the workplace, returning to working at work, then it largely uh, worsens our well-being for most groups, but especially so uh, for younger women and older women, younger men and older men, um, as well as uh, women with some um, caregiving obligations. And the ex exception is for men with intensive care obligations. They seem to um, be somehow um, benefiting from a returning. Um, for a hybrid arrangement, we see an almost uh, mirror uh, image that uh, it largely improves on well-being. But this is especially the case um, for, again, for women and men at both ends of the life um, course. And again, on the exception is men with intensive um, care obligations. They, their well-being really seems to take a hit if they have to work in a hybrid arrangement, possibly um, because historically our uh, men's lives were largely, uh, rep was largely represented by a uh, separation of work and family. So they might not that uh, used to uh, having to combine work and family, right, to uh, living in this somehow um, hybrid uh, working arrangement. So that could um, indicate, uh, explain why uh, their well-being seems to um, be particularly vulnerable to a hybrid arrangement. So um, that's all um, for, uh, for today, and uh, I look forward um, to your questions. Um, thank you very much.
you want to stop yeah. sharing and then you'll see it's a chat. Okay. You open up the chat at the bottom. Let me see. It's not familiar. Okay. 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 Yes. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. I have a question. This is great. So much to uh, digest. So I'm still yeah. kind of getting my head around it. But the question I had, and I understand. You know, for the purpose of this talk, you went with the life course and gender, and there were some other intersectionalities that you're exploring. I saw race and ethnicity, but I didn't see if you're also looking at partnership status, mm -hmm. so especially when you put up the first quote or the second quote by Mandy, who was single um, mom, you know, being har harassed by her child. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Related to. Um, I <laughs> wondered if, like, if you know, she was a single mom, and so I was wondering about like a release valve for child care or other things when you're on meetings and how that could change the shape of your experience of hybrid or remote work. And so have you looked at or thought about partnership status of your respondents? Yeah, so, okay, so uh, uh, so the question is about on the partnership uh, status uh, for the respondents and how that affect their uh, well-being. Um, so this is, a, this is a great question. and. Uh, it's actually something that uh, we plan to incorporate as part of the you know live course stage um, variable because you could uh, easily uh, you know distinguish single on parents versus those uh, who have uh, partners at home, but we don't have uh, many um, such cases. So many of the respondents are either don't have a partner whatsoever, or they have a you know marriage um, partner and have um, children. So that's uh, why we don't uh, really um, make a distinct. A distinct group for that um, category. We control for this. Um, uh, I mean, we don't control. We control for um, their partnership status and whether their partners work from home or work on uh, at work. Um, but we don't um, control for, for example, single um, parents. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And um, if I can guess what might happen, it's possibly that on those single parents. Yeah, I actually don't know because I guess it depends on whether they, they have um, child care um, support from, for example, um, their parents or uh, from um, some other institutions. Um, we could um, try to capture some of the, for example, regional variation in terms of the um, closing of child care facilities to um, capture that. But uh, at this point, we don't have that um, data. But another thing I was thinking about is that we have this uh, single mom, not uh, Mandy that I just uh, showed, but another uh, single mom who was a call center uh, worker. And uh, she um, just really liked, liked uh, remote work because uh, she said that it allows her to really have um, more time to spend with uh, her children, which was not the case at all um, before the pandemic, even though uh, she needs to do all the uh, caregiving work uh, by herself. Um, she still feels that it's better um, than, than nothing. And uh, uh, later on, uh, she has to go back to uh, work at work um, because her uh, manager just really pushing her to do so. And uh, she said that um, she probably are going to change her job uh, in, instead of um, going back. So, um, so yes, I, I, I feel that it might be um, some you know, interesting um, dimensions and um, variations across on that dimension um, by, by that. That's great. Um, thanks, Anne. Yeah. I also really enjoyed this talk, Glenn. Thank you so much. Thank um, my you. question has to do with, uh, do you have insight about the, the young and older workers who are saying that their work-family conflict increased when they didn't have children? So are they talking about, and it relates to Anne's question, are they talking about their partner? Or are they talking about family that doesn't live in the household? Or are they talking about their life in general has suffered? Like they're, they're doing this category of like work-life balance, which may, with, because they don't have family living in the house with them. Yes. May, maybe it's their, their life to create their family has been disrupted because yeah. I don't know. So do you have insight over what that, what they're talking about when, like young women and young men who don't have children, but do they have partners? Is that what's driving it? Like their relationships with a partner or is it with extended family or future family? Yeah, that's uh, that's another um, good question. And that's uh, the reason why I want to emphasize, especially for the work to family on conflict, that it's not just on work to family. 
So I feel for those um, uh, older or younger women and men without um, caregiving obligations, they are really um, trying to um, suggesting their personal uh, lives. And uh, uh, so I don't have uh, like quantitative evidence to support that because we didn't collect that uh, measures. But in uh, other studies um, uh, done uh, during the COVID-19, we see that uh, especially those, uh, on one hand, we have those uh, younger generations, uh, millenniums and uh, Gen, X, Gen Zs uh, even. So they uh, really wanted to have the opportunity to uh, work remotely in order to pursue their own uh, lives or to have a new um, fashion of work um, they want to um, create. So uh, it's not necessarily um, children or other uh, adult care um, they are talking about, but really about developing themselves. For uh, older workers, I, I feel that's perhaps more complicated. Um, so one, on one hand, um, some of these older workers, they might actually um, providing um, some care. We're not sure for their grandchildren, right? So some of these um, grandparents really take on the obligations to um, care for their grandchildren during the pandemic, given that many of workers, they have to work uh, at the workplace. But also um, some of these older uh, women and men, I, I think they possibly are also thinking about their personal lives, right? So how to, um, you know, how to spend their leisure time that they didn't really uh, have and uh, whether, um, and based on the findings, things that um, the ability to work remotely or in a hybrid arrangement really allow them to, to do so. So, yeah, so I think um, uh, these questions are very difficult to get um, through some, you know, quantitative questions. And we are still in the process of analyzing those qualitative um, data, which might give us more insights regarding what kinds of stresses that they are really um, talking about. Um, yeah, great. Thanks. Yeah. I was thinking about a similar thing. Um, so this is all basically before Mm -hmm. Yes. And so I know, like, for those older workers, especially who are at the highest risk of the vaccine, yeah. uh, COVID, that, that's true. Like, when I, when my husband went back to work pre vaccine, no mask mandate, that caused conflict. I was like, are you sure you should be going into work right now? You know, are you wearing your mask all day? Are the people around you wearing your mask? And yeah. I imagine if he was 20 years older, that would be even more. Sure. Yeah, that's definitely the case. Uh, yeah, and thank you for that question because uh, the health concern is a big um, part of whether you want to work from home or work um, at work. Right? It might not have nothing to do with your preference towards remote work, just uh, the ability to be in a relatively safe uh, environment. We do see uh, some um, people mention this in qualitative um, data. They really uh, hate that, right? not necessarily um, COVID, but that uh, this general sense, and it's not just for older workers that uh, when a pandemic was still on widespread, was it really safe for me to go back? And if the organizations really push them to do so, they feel this lack of perceived organizational support for their health, for their um, safety, which could affect their um, job satisfaction in particular. So, yeah. yeah. If you're getting exposed at work, you're less likely to want to put your other family members at risk. That's true, yeah, yeah. That's a great point. Yeah, this uh, uh, spillover or crossover on effect that uh, definitely is the case um, yeah, in a pandemic. Yeah. So. Uh, I just wanted to say, I don't know about studies that have been done, but just from my uh, sort of anecdotal experience, young people are, have been particularly stressed because it's not only their health that they're concerned with, but their future, you know, what's going to happen, this uncertainty that just really, and, and then when when things change and they are not in control of those changes, I think it might exacerbate it. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. I was surprised at the effects on, on young people without children, because of course we associated children <laughs> as part of the, the real constraint. But I, I think there's a story to be told about young people who are not yet uh, with children and um, and maybe not even partners, the stress of life during COVID. Yeah, and uh, for many young workers, it was actually, um, you know, they might not even have met their co-workers when they began to uh, work in the um, pandemic. 
Um, so yeah, I'm also surprised to see some of the findings because I feel that uh, this support on, uh, received from coworkers can be critical for young workers in particular. And, uh, um, you know, and it's easier to receive such support um, in a in-person setting. So yeah, so it's um, just interesting to see all the, some of these um, findings. Um, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>